First reading is from the book of Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in the view of his appearings and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not use, will, will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will ac accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and who will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. The word of the Lord. Now we will read Psalm 119 in unison. O oh God, I love your law. All the day long it is in my mind. Your commandment has made me wiser than my enemies, and it is always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your decrees are my study. I am wiser than the elders, because I observe your commandments. I restrain my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I do not shrink from your judgments, because you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. They are sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your commandments, I gain understanding. Therefore, I hate every lying way. The word of the Lord. And for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet this widow keeps bothering me. I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning to you all. It's a, and always a great joy. It's lovely to be with you here on this 19th Sunday after Pentecost. You know, I had um, someone ask me once why I mentioned uh, sort of the day of the service at the beginning of my sermons, and I thought you might be interested in the answer to that too. It serves sort of like um, 
remember the old films where they would sync the sound with the video by doing one of those, those clappers? You know what I'm talking about? Well, similarly speaking, if you were listening to this sermon, say, 100 years from now, you know, as you were wondering why the great uh, evangelistic revival of Hilton Head happened in 2022, you know, you wonder, um, for instance, <laughs> you would say, uh, well, I wonder what Sunday he's preaching on, and I know I can now find the, the readings associated with that day. So I always mention the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, because you can Google that now, Siri, what readings were appointed to the Revised Common Lectionary for uh, the 19th Sunday of Pentecost, um, and if, uh, if they would answer that, they would say, well, these readings. And so there you go, just so, so you know, um, when I was in seminary, I listened to a, uh, was, was beginning to, to sort of learn how to preach and uh, still like to listen to other people's sermons, but particularly I had a, had a catalog from one particular preacher, and I was so grateful that he would always mention the, the day or something around the season so that I would be able to pull out my Bible and say, like, okay, how did you get to where you're going with that particular sermon? And so there you go. That's why I thought you might be interested. But I, I bring that up a little bit today only to uh, sort of segue into the fact that we have been given in our lectionary um, not just one or two, but in fact three separate readings that are all so rich and they're all so, um, uh, can be, could be mined um, so profoundly that I was uh, really caught up of how to, um, well, not address all three of them. <laughs> and so it's not a warning that this will be a sermon three times the normal length, but I am going to, to touch on the gospel, this part from uh, the, uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, and even a section that we did not read, but is in your bulletin from the prophet Jeremiah. So it's in your bulletin, but nevertheless, we're going to weave these things in a little bit, um, because as you could probably see from the title of the sermon, The New Covenant and the Old Myths, some of you may know that is a reference to the the new covenant prophesied by Jeremiah, fulfilled in Christ uh, for the sake of the world. At any rate, this is where we're headed, so I want to just give you a, a, a layout from the beginning. So here we go. Let's start with the gospel reading first, because it's very straightforward. We can thank Luke for this explanation right from the beginning, because as we hear Luke, he writes, Jesus told his disciples a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. So there we go. Thank you, Luke. Now we know what this parable is about. It is not intended to mine the sort of identity of the unjust judge. It's not to sort of put yourself in various places. It's just a, 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 a parable that Jesus teaches to encourage his disciples to pray and to not lose heart. So we'll hear a little bit more about this particular parable next week because we're going to continue in our walking through Luke. But I also wanted to uh, put, jump off from this final statement that Jesus says, but when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? All right, well, 2,000 plus years later, well, so far so good. Here we are. You know, people continue to pray to him. People are continuing to persevere in their prayer and not lose heart, just as his parable back then intended and continues to instruct us down to this day. You know, we've been hearing about this all-important concept of faith for the past couple of weeks now, somewhat unintendedly. You know, the, the readings are assigned to us, but even when Bishop Jackson from Tanzania came, his, the title of his sermon was simply Faith which has fit dovetailed very nicely into what has become sort of a series about the power and the persistence of the Christian witness when brought to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The ramifications of it, the life-altering reality of it, the the complexities of it, all through um, the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at what this all-important concept means. And today, we're going to look at how someone comes to faith in God. Because as we here uh, uh, continue to proclaim, we, we are hopeful and expectant that God is, in fact, going to bring unbelievers to faith in his son. Not just people that grew up Christian, but that there are neighbors and friends and people in your environment who do not know the Lord. And he will bring them to faith by the foolishness with what we preach, says Paul. This is what we're going to talk about today because we are intended to go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and part of that service is to proclaim his love for the lost and hurting to the ends of the earth. That's what we are to do. So how does this actually happen? We're going to talk about today. So over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at the Apostle Paul and his letter to Timothy. As I've said before, Paul is writing at the end of his life. Uh, this is a pastoral epistle. This is essentially like a private letter that the Lord allowed to be preserved and then published for the sake of the church. But this is a very heartfelt letter that Paul is teaching his son in the faith. 
about how to withstand the trials and temptations of life, persevere in ministry, and ultimately take comfort in the fact that Paul, despite the fact he's facing his death, is facing it with the confidence of the resurrection that Jesus has set before him. So go back and read it on your own in that light, and you'll be edified by it. But at this uh, section in Timothy, at the beginning of chapter 3, it's entitled in our, in our Bible, Godlessness in the Last Days. You see, Paul is talking about the last days, which we have been involved with since Pentecost. Now, if you remember in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit fell and the church was birthed, then the last days were upon us, where by the power of the Spirit, despite the darkness of the world, the church was formed, and that church would continue to grow one heart at a time, and the gates of hell itself would not prevail. So although we have not yet come to the last day, because we're still here, Nevertheless, we live in the last days, and we will continue to be in these last days until the last day comes. And in these last days, as the writer to Ecclesiastes sort of observed, that there is nothing new under the sun. That the human heart, the inequity and the sinfulness of the human heart manifests itself in a very general shape amongst those who reject the truth of God. It looks basically the same, different languages, different times, different dress, but the human heart will work itself out in its own sinful desires in very similar ways from time immemorial down through today. I mean, can you imagine if you didn't have a break or a governor on your conscience, if you had no, as it were, catch in your spirit when it came to the affairs of the world? to the lusts of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life, if you didn't have something that brought you up short, can you imagine what your life would be like? Well, Paul describes to Timothy exactly what people who do not have these sort of governors over their consciences will look like in these last days. He writes, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be... Get this, lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, Timothy. This is what these people will look like, Paul writes. Avoid such people, he says. Avoid such people, not for the sake of, um, of evangelism, but that this would be the world into which he was sent to preach God and his saving work in Christ for their souls in order to deliver them from a world that is so described, from an unrestrained heart that has no conscience about the law and the goodness and the holiness of God. Send them into, send Timothy into this world proclaiming something that they will find foolish and ridiculous until it becomes the life-changing and unalterably uh, profound event of their entire lives. That's what Paul sent people into the world to proclaim. Now, I was raised in the church by God's grace, and I have never really been outside, nor do I wish to be outside of a general Christian community. And I grew up in the Deep South, and so this extended well beyond my, my uh, immediate family. And to be sure, in Baton Rouge, there certainly were many people who probably claimed to be Christian who we may not have, say had sort of a deep and abiding faith, right? Maybe they weren't here every time the church doors open, but... They were constrained by the general shape, not of an unbelieving culture, but of a believing culture. The general shape of a culture that was formed over centuries, if not millennia, here in the West by these divine prohibitions. A general culture that was sh shaped by the fear of committing adultery, by the prohibition against murdering, by the desire to avoid being a liar, a cheat, by the prohibition against theft, prohibitions against unchecked greed and unvarnished envy and covetousness. This was the general shape of the world formed by a fear of God over against the general shape of what Paul knew a world without fear of God would look like. And you know, some people sort of are contempt for the quote nominal Christian culture, 
you know, you'll hear them sort of argue that the church now can be more authentic, that fewer and fewer people are confessing faith. And so now we can know who the true believers are and the, and the, and the sort of just the, the people that claim to be Christian. And well, you know, perhaps there's something in that clarification which is um, expedient in some way. But at the end, but at the end of the day, uh, I still uh, think that we should defend and we should we should pray for the manifestation of some form of conformity to the law and the goodness of God, because we should not celebrate the loss of anything that looks like Christian culture. Because when you lose that, then you lose the guardrails. The protections against the human heart are removed, and the manifestation of the darkness of the human heart is on full display. And that is a spectacle with which the Apostle Paul would have been very well acquainted, and one, as he looks around today, would have seen great similarities with the ancient world as of now, because the shapes always remain the same. Timothy, these people... Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, and so on and so forth. Timothy, these are the people we have been sent into the world to save by what we proclaim to them has been done in Christ for the sake of sin. That's what Paul said then and what he says down till today, which is why we take heart. This is why we, we, we're, we're joyful people who feast in the middle of our world because we are not too far gone for revival. Every single time we pray, thy kingdom come, we are asking for the Holy Spirit to descend and do what he does. Namely, bring conviction of sin to the world so that people will turn to the Lord for pardon and peace. That's what we pray for. We pray for the Holy Spirit to come and open the eyes and ears of an unbelieving world that, get this, the greatest tragedy, does not believe in sin and yet suffers the consequence. This is a deep tragedy. You can very easily be dying of something that you have no idea what is killing you, and that is precisely what is taking place in a world where the wages of sin is death, says Paul. And we are praying that people would no longer persist in their unbelief, but that they would come to see not merely the effects of sin in their lives, but the cure, because when they realize not only the effects but the cure and see in Jesus their Savior, well then when the burden of them becomes intolerable as we pray, we know who will take our burdens. We know where to lay them down. We know where to find pardon and forgiveness and peace at his mercy seat. We know the effects of sin very well, which is why we come and worship our risen Savior week after week after week. You see, this knowledge of God through the forgiveness of sins is the very essence of the new covenant, which was inaugurated by Jesus in his own blood. As you can read in Jeremiah in your bulletin of the new covenant, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. No, excuse me. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them out of the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is a covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This is how people will come to know the Lord in the new covenant. Notice how he is known. It may recall to you parts of our communion liturgy, which is simply the recounting of Jesus. This is my blood of the new covenant of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. In the forgiveness of sins, the Lord is rightly known, and that is what we preach to an unbelieving world, expectant that they will come to see Jesus as their Savior. But don't take my word for it. Don't take my word alone for it. Listen to Jesus explain the work of the Holy Spirit. 
And people always wonder, what is the Holy Spirit doing? It's sort of amorphous, and what is, you know, and, and certainly there's great power, and the Holy Spirit comes. But Jesus also gives us some parameters of how to understand his presence with us. And it's in, in, in a section from John called the, the Upper Room Discourse, if you want to know. So after Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper and washes his disciples' feet, they're in the Upper Room, and they begin to make the, the walk towards um, the, the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's ultimately uh, betrayed and, and um, arrested. In that intervening time, between John 13 and John 17, we hear what's called these, the upper room discourse, where he teaches them about all sorts of things that are going to happen to them and warns them about prosecu- persecutions that are coming and also tells them that he's about to leave, okay? So at this section, when he says, and I'm going to go, he says, oh, and I say I'm going to go, and it makes all of you a lot of, uh, really upset. Well, don't be so upset, he says, and I'll continue with Jesus' own words. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. He will convict the world, in other words, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. That's Jesus himself telling us what the work and role of the Holy Spirit initially in the world would be, would be to convict the world of sin, to bring an awareness of their need. The spirit of truth will bring this into the world and it will prompt and spark revival. Because where this truth is brought to bear, then people are forced to their knees in search of a savior. We call that conversion. We call that redemption. We see in that the new covenant in his blood, secured by Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, doing its work as promised. Paul knew very well what an unbelieving world looked like. Timothy was one of his dearest converts to the faith, and they both stood on that faith, which is why here, at the end of his life, Paul exhorts him as would a loving father, having both reminded him of the rotten fruit of an unbelieving world into which he was being sent, and yet he was still being sent. Take heart, Timothy. But as for you, he writes, as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. You see, Paul was very well aware of how the human heart worked. He instructed Timothy in all of these various nuances and warned him appropriately then and still down through the ages of how the sinful human nature will manifest itself until it finds its redemption in the person and work of Christ. You see, these old myths that Paul talks about to which people slide back in, they return and wander away. These old myths don't look any different today than they did back then. Sure, we call them by other names, but they're still believed and worshiped even so today. I mean, get this, in Paul's day, some people would have been believed the myth that they were born essentially good and that whatever was wrong with them was the fault of someone else perhaps a broken institution, or maybe a lack of education or money, or perhaps a lack of loving parents. That would be one of the myths that they would labor under their entire lives. Some people would have believed the myth that all of what we call gods are just human projections, and that eventually, even if there is a heaven, which there probably isn't, that only quote-unquote good people will be there, and that good will be defined very defined very subjectively on an individual by individual basis. So people labor under this myth to this day. Get this one. Some people believe the myth back then that the universe came out of nothing and that over a period of time plus chance, all of this just appeared. And that just as we came from nothing, we will return to nothing. And that will then be the guiding myth for your entire life. Some people had the audacity to believe that in Paul's day and age. Some people believed in the myth of reincarnation, 
Some people believe that God helps those who help themselves. Some people believe that they were spiritual but not religious. In short, people have always been susceptible to myths and vain speculation about God, which is precisely why he established his church in the world, to correct these misunderstandings and to proclaim the gospel of his forgiveness found in Christ alone for the sake of the world. You see, the power of God is manifested through the transformation of unbelieving people into his believing sons and daughters by faith in his crucified and risen son. And it's in our professed weakness to save ourselves that he shows his strength. We are the community of the fallen and in need of redemption. We are the, 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 the family of the broken, of the sinful, of the, of the unclean being made clean. This is our weakness that we proclaim to the world. And in that proclamation, his power is displayed. Mighty to save. And until he comes again, during these last days, we'll continue to follow the instruction and example of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Paul writes, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, Timothy, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. Well, Timothy listened, and the church down through the ages has continued to heed Paul's instruction. We will proclaim this message, the message of God's law which convicts and his gospel which redeems. The two words that he has given us to shepherd and to proclaim to the world, we will proclaim. We will be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. There are seasons of sowing and seasons of reaping, and we're not in charge of anything uh, with, with respect to that other than persistence during the time that we have been allotted. We will attempt to convince. We will implore. We will, we will, uh, we will discuss and dispute with an unbelieving world about the truth of God in Christ. And we will rebuke just as the holy word of God has rebuked us. We will proclaim unashamedly and unabashedly the judgment of God on sin and revel in the pardon that he has shown to us. Freely offering the word of forgiveness to even the most hardened and wicked people among us. And finally, we we will encourage and be encouraged, just as Timothy was, just as Paul instructed with the utmost patience and teaching, knowing that God's people, through the blood of the new covenant, will not have to wonder about God. We will not have to search for him in vain, and we will not slide back into the pious myths of old, because, as Jeremiah prophesied, we and the whole church will continue to see that they shall all know me, says the Lord, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their iniquity, And remember their sin no more. Thanks be to God. Amen.